my name is Jana Valakovic, and I'm with the University of California Cooperative Extension. And I'm a forester, and I'm going to talk about wildfire issues associated with redwood forests. Hi, my name is Michael Jones. I am the University of California Cooperative Extension Forest Advisor for Mendocino Lake and Sonoma Counties. And I will be talking with Jana about post fire redwood forest survival and generation. And we're going to highlight fires from 2003, 2008, and 2020 across uh, Northern California for this talk. So we're going to highlight three separate fires. Uh, one that is called the Canoe Fire that took place in the fall in 2003 in Humboldt Redwood State Park in an old growth setting. Uh, additionally, we're going to look at the Mendocino Complex, um, at least briefly, from June 2008 in Mendocino County in managed redwood forest. And then third, we're going to look at the LNU complex from Santa Cruz County that occurred in 2020. When you step back and look at how our society and culture have thought about fire, I think these two quotes illustrate sort of the juxtaposition of what we're currently experiencing with that which uh, has been promoted for a long time. So from 1899, this quote I really find interesting, there is one cause of destruction from which the tree is entirely exempt, and that is fire. No fire can run in a redwood forest. It is only one of our coniferous lumber trees, which is thus exempt. Well, I think we might have a slightly different view upon on that statement now, um, but it has pervaded or, or it has um, become part of our regular planning process. And here's uh, a management plan also in Humboldt County from 2001, of which fire in the cool, humid climatic environment is, in which the forest stands of the reserve are located is not considered to be a major risk. Significant fire events in this regime apparently have low frequency of occurrence. So are these forests truly asbestos uh, and exempt from fire, or uh, is something else occurring? So I think to put the context together, I want to talk a little bit about these couple of fires that we're going to be working on. And, uh, trying to understand the frequency of fire is slightly complicated in redwood, um, and that is because redwood has missing rings, um, and I, I won't describe that in, in great detail, but uh, it makes it difficult to really be accurate in our assessment of fire scars and fire return intervals. Prior work in the late 80s looked at Humboldt Redwood State Park and estimated that the fire return interval to be about 26 years. but uh, following the canoe fire, where we were able to do more um, intensive investigation, uh, Dr. Steve Norman figured out that the re return interval was closer to 12 to 13 years, so something a little more frequent than had been in the common literature prior to that. And the canoe fire had had um, more than 60 years passed since the last fire in that area, so it had missed a number of fire return intervals. And I, I think it's interesting to look at those numbers and also compare to some of what is in the literature um, from Santa Cruz Mountains that also talks about a 12-year return interval. So fire is probably more frequent in redwood forests than most people think. So for today's talk, we're going to talk about fire severity. We're going to talk about assessing damage and, and trying to predict survival. We'll talk a bit about redwood sprouting, um, and then some of the mitigation issues that are commonly associated with fire, such as roads and erosion. And then we'll end with some comments around best management practices, salvage, and really come from the frame of trying to help landowners build back better. So building back better in their infrastructure and their overall layout and framework for management with their forests. So drilling into the canoe fire in Humboldt Redwood State Park and from 2003 here is just one image to show kind of the density of vegetation uh, prior to um, this fire and, you know, to illustrate that there was a lot of uh, material that had accumulated, a lot of uh, dead material as well as uh, green material. We call those both dead fuels and live fuels. But even with all that material, I think what surprised most people was that the flame lengths were relatively small. They, they were on average about 6 to 12 inches, uh, and that's as noted here in this image. There were pockets of greater intensity and there were some flare-ups, um, but for the most part it was relatively low severity across the 13,000 acres of forest, which are primarily old growth, so there are some second growth stands as well. And 
this fire did remind me about how you get those really neat basal hollow formations um, where you get fire that gets into uh, a cavity and just you know hollows it out and and it became really clear to me that these kinds of structures which are very important for wildlife are not formed in one year alone or one fire alone it's successive fires and successive exposures we also saw that uh, Douglas fir um, was a lot more um, vulnerable to fire than I had previously thought. And that's in part because of the bark sloughing that occurs with Douglas fir and the accumulation of, of fuels at the bases of these, of these trees. But it's also because um, this fire had what was called a long residence time. In other words, it burned for a long duration. While the flame lengths weren't tall or high, the fire did sit for several weeks and continue to, to cook some of these trees. And that led to mechanical failures, like as illustrated by this Douglas fir tree, as well as just overall root damage. Um, and so, you know, it, it helps show why redwood is kind of the, the successional species um, to be in the dominant position because Douglas fir just really isn't as well adapted to fire as redwood is. Now, with wildfire, severity is always patchy. And, you know, I think that's one of the things to keep in mind. You don't have uniform burn conditions across the whole geography. And you can see some of the higher intensity uh, fire here. It got into the crowns, especially along the ridges uh, and especially along the areas where the stands were younger and there were ladder fuels that carried the fire into the crowns of these trees and then aided by wind. Yeah, and, and just to reiterate, so this is an uh, image from the uh, 2020 Santa Cruz fires, the CZU, and, and this fire was certainly considered at a higher higher severity than the canoe fire, but even in a fire that we kind of classify as high severity, which in, in many aspects this was, that, that across the landscape, fire severity, the impact on the landscape is highly variable, and even here you have areas that are still green and healthy, and so it's really important to remember that when we think about these fires that everything doesn't look like the moon when you're done, right? You know, the ridges might have more damage uh, because maybe of the vegetation type or because of the topography or because of the exposure. Um, but then some other areas might might be have uh, might have survived or, or have less severe impacts. And so it's really important to remember that as we think about managing these these forests or these these natural resources after fire events that uh, not everything will be completely destroyed and that we'll be able to kind of assess this um, as, as we uh, look at different stands. Right, so it's all about scales, isn't it? Yeah. Now, one of the interesting things about redwood and thinking about um, interpreting the post-fire uh, condition or the post-burn condition is that redwood bark is actually quite fibrous and um, what you'll see is that the flame, once it's on the ground, it will kind of creep its way up to the up the tree. And so here's an example of a tour that I led shortly after the, the conditions were safe to be in this canoe fire. And you will see a black line that's 25, 30 feet high. Um, and a lot of folks think of that as a wall of flames that came through 25 to 30 feet high uh, across this forest. But instead, it was really 6 to 12 inch flame lengths but then you had this creeping pattern where you'd have smoldering um, take place up the tree. As a result of that, you actually can see diameters shrinking because the bark will actually burn to a, a certain amount. So like if you look at this little ledge right here, you can see that there was quite a bit of smoldering here uh, and consumption of bark. And so you can imagine that the, the circumference of, or the diameter of this tree is now a little bit um, thinner than it was before. So interpreting redwood uh, burn patterns is a little tricky compared to the average um, site that you might work in with other forest types. One of the other things that, in, that is interesting, just looking at this image, so this is one month after the fire, and you can see how many um, needles were already down, and you can see the cast of, of material that is already starting to insulate the soil and protect the soil from erosion. So there's a lot of canopy in redwood stands to, and a lot of uh, leaf material that's able to come down and provide that kind of immediate mulching, um, assuming that you didn't have a fire that crowned out and burned all of that off. Again, just a couple more images where you can see that uh, there was some consumption overall of the, the shrubs and, and lower strata material, but for the most part, um, it was relatively, um, uh, you know, focused on the leaf material and, and the materials just on top of the soil for the most part. 
All right. So, you know, we've looked at the, the, the fire severity across the landscape and, and now we want to look at, so how does that, how does that relate to the predicted survival or, or the mortality of individual trees or, or trees within the stand? And so, you know, across tree species, there's real common ways to assess um, mortality. Um, and for redwoods, we're focusing on, on bark scorching, like Yana was talking about, where we look at the damage to the bark. Uh, probably the most important variable to look at is the cambium damage, also the root damage that can be caused through direct flame contact or heat exposure. We'll look at canopy scorching, which isn't necessarily one of the most important variables in redwoods, uh, at similar, uh, or, you know, as it would be relative to other conifers. And then we'll, we'll kind of talk about how that, how that can be classified or rated into a burn severity. So for example, um, Survival decreases with increase in severity. So the more burn severity a tree has, especially if it's a small tree, you can expect uh, more likely that there'll be mortality. But as trees get larger, it takes more high severity damage to potentially kill that tree. And as always, it's really important to remember that redwoods are extremely resilient. And um, you know, you, it's hard to make an initial assessment and predict mortality directly after a fire. They actually need time to see if that tree recovers before you can really understand what, what might have happened. So we'll look at these in more detail. So the first one we're going to look at is bark scorching. And essentially what that is, is, is direct flame contact that consumes the bark material. Remember, we talked about redwood bark having, uh, you know, Yana mentioned it has a real flaky kind of fibrous structure, which means that it, it easily ignites, but it breaks away from the tree. So it has this kind of really cool burn behavior. Um, but if you get a lot of heat and a lot of, of flame contact, it'll consume that bark completely, which is, uh, can cause damage to the woody tissues, uh, the really important and, and, and necessary woody tissues below the bark. And so here you can see in this photo that the inside of that fairy ring, those trees had a lot of heat, a lot of flame damage, and the bark was completely consumed, uh, da damaging that woody tissue. So the most important thing, like I mentioned before, that we want to look at and we want to look for is cambium damage. And so, you know, you can look at the bark to get a sense of maybe how much damage is that cambium. But the best way to do that is to actually hack it off. And, and before you do that, a really cool way to assess um, the, the, the damage is to use the sounding of, uh, uh, test, usually with a hammer or some heavy mallet or something, where if you hit the tree and it creates a thud, that indicates that that cambium is still alive because there's moisture in there. If it creates more of an echo sound, that's likely dead and dry. So you can use that initially to assess the damage to your tree. If you think your tree, you know, you go around and you hit it around the circumference of the stem and you, and you find that maybe more than 50% of it sounds dead, uh, that could be a pretty significant issue. But when you hack the bark off, you can look under it and you can actually see the cambium where it's dead and alive. On the left side uh, of kind of that brown line where the arrow is, you see that healthy living cambium. You see the bark is still has a really nice, healthy pink red color. The cambium is kind of a, 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 a whitish color. It's moist to the touch. Then on the right side of that arrow, you see that's dead cambium. It's dry, it's discolored. You look at the bark tissue, it's all discolored. And so that's a really good way to assess the damage to the tree. Now remember that, you know, portion of the cambium dead won't necessarily kill the tree. Uh, if the cambium is dead all the way around the circumference of the tree, we call that girdling, and that typically will result in, for redwoods, what we call top kill or that above ground biomass. But, you know, there's, there's, a, uh, uh, there's some level of damage the tree can tolerate before you ex experience this mortality. So it's important to look for that variable for that damage. Uh, another really important one is root damage. Redwoods have really shallow roots. And so if there's a lot of heat on the ground, it's, there's a high potential for some root damage. And so you can really get a sense, as you see in this photo, the root collar, the base of those trees, there's a lot of heat. If you look at the roots leading away, the large roots that are just below the soil surface, and a lot of them are damaged all the way around the tree, that's a pretty significant um, indication that there might be mortality in that tree. So looking at root damage, is also really important. And again, the larger the tree, the more damage it can tolerate, but the roots are, you know, they provide, not only are they important for nutrient and, and the water cycles, but also structural. So if there's any amount of root damage, you could have issues with tree st stability and failure and, and they could be hazard trees. So that's also something to look for. And where you have uh, redwoods growing close to streams, you might actually see fire go down those roots um, and you can have persistence and burn for even, uh, you know, 
well into the wedding cycle of the year. So um, if there's something to burn, it, you know, often you'll see fire run down those those root lines. And, you know, so beware a little bit for your safety, too, because yeah. there can be pockets uh, where you still have, you know, smoldering going on below the soil. Yeah, that's a good point. So the, the last thing we look at is canopy scorching. And on redwoods, that's not necessarily a really good predictor of mortality. Uh, you know, with other conifers, maybe you can get a better sense of whether that tree will survive or die based on the percentage of the damage or scorching or torching or whatever you want to call it the, to the foliage. Uh, but on redwoods, because there's they're prolific sprouters, which we'll talk about in a second, um, you know, it doesn't, they can really regenerate that tissue, the, that photosynthetic tissue fairly, fairly easily. So we don't typically rely on the amount of damage to the canopy. Now, if you had, as you can see in some of those photos, the canopy was completely torched, like the fire canopy through that particular cluster of trees, you know, maybe there's a little bit more supports to suggest that that tree had some significant damage and there might be some question of its survival, but even that doesn't mean that the tree's dead and we'll show some examples. What's really interesting about looking at scorching is you can get leaf freeze, which it occurs when you have winds blowing with, you know, hot winds blowing because of the fire behavior and they usually freeze in the direction in which the, the fire was coming from, so the direction the wind was blowing. And that can not necessarily tell you mortality, but can give you kind of a, a sense of what was happening to that tree when the fire came through. What, way, what direction was the fire coming from? Uh, how intense was that fire behavior? And so you can use that as kind of when you're looking around a stand or individual trees, you can get a better sense of what might have been happening at, at the time. And, um, and so, you, you know, you see this, this kind of, uh, this is a stand of second growth redwood. You see there's a lot of bark charring. Uh, there's some canopy torching. And, you know, it, it looks pretty dramatic, but once you get in and you start looking at the cambium, you look at the root structures, that most of these trees will probably be just fine. They didn't even have a branch, you know, mortality. They probably are gonna re-sprout foliage from, from the branches and they'll probably recover quite nicely. However, you get in there, you see there is some scorching and cambium damage. So there might be a few of the smaller trees that died. But even though this looks pretty dramatic, um, you know, most of these trees are probably going to be all right after, after the next season. They'll probably leaf out just fine. Uh, so it's really important to kind of, you know, take a, a second look and reassess your trees instead of kind of relying on that first impression. And for those that have just experienced wildfire, the process of recovery in redwoods is really quick. Um, here's some images, again, from the canoe fire between one and six months after the fire. And you can see that these seedlings, um, you know, re-sprouted relatively quickly um, and aggressively and robustly. And so, you know, it's kind of fun to see the fresh green tissues come back and realize the process of renewal will, will occur. On the right is a picture of a burl, and you can see the burl already starting to initiate. So. Um, you know, these trees will respond upon moisture and, and upon the beginning of the rainy season. Additionally, the, the vegetation and the plants will begin to respond, and there's whole sorts of plants that are really fire dependent um, or fire adapted. And like this Douglas iris here in the, on the left, I think is really triggered by fire. Um, and we probably see greater expansion of the Douglas iris populations as a result of a fire. So it's, it's fun to, to take some time and get to know the plants that come up just after fire. And you can also see what, you know, what a young uh, redwood seedling looks like. Um, here's just one of these cones that's regenerated um, following the fire. So, you know, take a moment and step back. There'll be whole sets of uh, fungi that you're probably not familiar with that are unique to a post-fire environment. And there's just a, a whole process of the world kind of renewing that is, I think, a lot of fun to watch. Now there are some specific conditions that I think get a little tricky to try and interpret. And with scorching, where you have a lot of heat and that kills some of the leaves and potentially some of the branches, um, you know, not all of those trees will be able to uh, send new tissues out uh, on those um, heat-treated branches. So here's an example on the left. Um, this is again from that 2003 fire in um, in Humboldt, where you know, some of the individual trees were, were, were lost, but then many of them just kind of came back in this fuzzy appearance, um, you know, sort of looking shaggy overall. But, you know, that says that you've got pretty strong um, chance that those trees are going to survive and do real well. 
Now, in contrast to a fire in Mendocino County, this is in second growth stands, you can see that there was so much heat that the branches really didn't involve, but the, um, the boles of the trees began to uh, reinitiate new branches, and you get this kind of bottle brush look. Um, that definitely is an indication that there's been a fair bit of impact. Um, the tree will survive. Uh, the question is whether it's going to thrive to the same degree and uh, whether or not, you know, if you're looking from a wood quality perspective, what does that do? Because it's just initiated a whole lot of, of uh, branchlets and then you're going to have some change in wood quality there, more knots, for example. So monitoring trees through time and, and because redwood can send out new tissues makes them a little tricky and a little interesting to watch. So when you think about, you know, fire and second growth redwood stands, you know, uh, you know, redwood mortality, it's common in the sapling and pole size uh, trees, but it's not so common in the, in the larger trees. You will see a lot of epicormic sprouting, so that's sprouting on the outside of either the branches or the bowl. Um, and damage, you know, will probably slow growth, but by how much, it's really not known. Uh, but do keep in mind that some of the other trees, especially those that don't have a, a branch, um, a sprouting capacity such as Douglas fir uh, may perish from the fire, but other trees, especially the Douglas or the tan oak or the madrone, um, they also have that sprouting capacity, and you'll you'll see them you know come and bounce right back in the same ways that that redwood does in some, from their burls. Another thing to be thinking about uh, when you uh, are reviewing a stand that's been um, impacted by fire is really to pay attention to kind of the roads and erosion issue. And, you know, roads are uh, problematic because they can be, you know, big contributors of sediment to streams and, you know, that can cause pretty significant damages to water quality and fish habitat. And um, so we make every effort to try and mitigate and um, try and alleviate that process. So, you know, after fire, there's evaluating the, um, the roads that may have been put in as fuel breaks um, and making sure that there's drainage that's been reestablished and so you don't get concentration of water. One of the other issues you really need to do is, is assess your existing road network uh, for its overall condition. So that means walking the entire road network, looking at all the culverts and making sure that those culverts are still functioning in good shape. If you had plastic culverts, um, this might be a surprise, but plastic culverts do burn in wildfire. So often you can see this kind of rock armoring inside what, where, what the area was where the culvert is, but the culvert's missing. So if that has happened, um, then you really have an immediate crisis and something that needs to be uh, handled right away. Because as soon as you put water in there, that whole road base will, will fail. And um, then you have the potential to take that whole fill structure over the culvert and introduce that to a stream, for example. There are other elements of road bases that can be impacted too. There may have been some woody debris that was in the road base and that can ignite during fire. Um, so you may have some loss of fill. Um, so there's a bunch of work that needs to be done in, in evaluating kind of the overall infrastructure in its current condition. You also want to look out for burned out stumps and roots. Um, you know, there's some hazards as shown in the right on, on, that, on that, um, that stump that has now uh, been consumed. Um, and then, you know, you're going to want to keep walking those roads and checking them out, especially for the first few rains and if you know you've got a big rain coming. Um, there are some things that can be done uh, to try and manage some of the erosion that might be uh, transferred into those culverts. And so a more thorough evaluation of slope, vegetation condition, the amount of natural mulching that comes from the redwood needles, you know, all those factors need to come together to, to try and um, assess whether or not you have an issue and whether you need to do some type of mitigation. But I do really want to reiterate that there is a natural mulching process that comes um, from needle and leaf cast. And this is in a Douglas fir portion of that canoe fire in Humboldt Redwoods. You can just see how thick that blanket of, of needle cast really was. So very effective at um, being able to protect that, that native soil there. So post-fire, some of the best management practices include evaluating trees for their hazards. So do you have enough um, damage in an individual tree that it may um, you know, cause impact to power lines, to buildings, to other elements of infrastructure? Um, another key element is to start to map uh, the severity. So where was the fire the hottest? Where was the fire the coolest? And 
um, you know, trying to get some spatial arrangement for that. And there are some folks that can help with some of that information. If you're in an area where there's um, a fire that's managed by federal folks, then you will get some of that mapping provided. Again, you want to inventory your roads, assess your culverts, and look for burned wood in the fill. Uh, and if you happen to live on the property or you have some other infrastructure, think about evaluating your water systems in general, your water tanks, your water lines, and other elements that are part of, of your overall property. I do think it's worthwhile thinking about permanent photo points because our minds will play tricks on us and it's amazing how quickly things change. So um, making some permanent photo point locations will be really helpful for you to, I think, see change through time and, and really see how amazing nature is at recovery. One of the downsides of fire is that um, we can get an introduction of weeds and some of the seeds may be in the seed bed already or in the, in the soil bed already or they may blow in from other locations or they may have gotten accidentally transported on uh, fire equipment. So you want to do an evaluation for those weeds and if you can get on those um, populations as soon as you can because um, it's much easier to take care of a small problem than a big one. You also need to make an evaluation of whether or not some type of um, revegetation action is needed. Do you need to replant? Did you lose a significant number of trees? Um, so it would be a good idea to work with a consulting forester to help you think through some of those revegetation issues and get a seedling order in um, so that you'll be ready uh, come, come the time that those seeds are the seedlings are available to, to replant. So this is a great time to, you know, create, if you haven't, or revisit your existing management plan and, you know, adjust some of your actions to meet your long-term objectives. In some cases, this fire, you know, in Redwood may not have made a, a major change or a major impact. In other cases, that, that may not be true. So when it comes uh, to fire in Redwood, I guess I think about it um, from a little bit of the less is often more perspective. Give the ecosystem some time to recover. It may not be that you need to put a major investment in because these redwood stands are incredibly resilient. However, if you had fire that um, contributed to significant um, heat effects on those redwood trees, salvage may be totally warranted and appropriate. You will need permits to, to be able to do those work and you will need to work with a registered professional forester, or RPF, as they're known. Um, and, you know, if you have Douglas fir trees that were damaged, uh, they do degrade rather quickly from both insects and beetles, so uh, quick action um, is really appropriate. And, you know, the good news is that fire damaged redwoods uh, don't really tend to get a major bark beetle attack, so you've got some more time to be able to evaluate those issues. And when you're thinking about these issues in the longer term, you know, how are you going to manage fuels through time? You know, what is going to be the impact of trees that may be coming down um, that will, you know, decline through time? How do you want to manage those fuels? So uh, thinking about both mechanical fuel removal and maybe using prescribed fire uh, during a, a more moderate fire time condition uh, can be, you know, really important tools in your toolbox. In general, you know, I just want to encourage you to build back better and think about overall property infrastructure. Think about how do you want to design and incorporate prescribed fire into your stands. You know, what the harvest operations will look like now and into the future. And, you know, maybe some of those fire lines really provide opportunity there. So thinking at a spatial scale can be really helpful in this moment. It may not be, you know, what you wanted to do right now, but you've been dealt the hand of fire. And so, if you can let go of the, the, the disappointment of having gone through that, uh, this might really be an opportunity to, to lace some of the things that you've been thinking about together to you know, sort of unify your plans and, and unify your longer term objectives. In conclusion, um, these redwood stands are incredibly resilient and here's the canoe fire 11 years later, you can barely even tell. Uh, that fire came through here, um, yet at the same time you can also see that there are some, a little bit of thinning that happened and s some good conditions that uh, I think are useful for these stands through time. So fire is an important part of the California landscape and fire is really important to, um, to redwood in general. So uh, it's, it's good to have its, its presence from time to time in these, in these forests. Michael and I will uh, conclude with a few resources. So um, there's some resources on understanding mortality and damage uh, that are available on the top, recovering from wildfire publication that we um, helped develop through UC Cooperative Extension, 
the roads and road design and road issues uh, very thoroughly covered in this uh, handbook that I would recommend for anyone in any place in California. And then there's a lot of great information about Redwood through these Redwood Symposia and each of the materials are, each of the proceedings are available. And then there's a lot of resources on the California Fire Science Consortium. Thank you for your interest in this topic and both Mike and I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you.